this next session, you'll see Robin Hanbury Tennyson being interviewed by Steve Axel. If you enjoy the session, take a selfie and share your digital festival experience on our Facebook, Twitter or Instagram accounts to encourage your friends to join in too. So now, please give a virtual welcome to Robin Hanbury Tennyson. Well, it's lovely to be back in the Isle of Wight again at the Literary Festival, even though it's not live. We'll do our best to do it in this funny new technological way. Um, I've spoken several times to the Isle of Wight, so quite a lot of you know me, but I'm an old explorer. Rainforests and deserts have been my habitat, and I've written a lot of books about that. This is my 26th book, and it's about taming the four horsemen. And uh, I use them as a template for the catastrophes that I see looming in the future and my rather radical solutions to them. Uh, it all began in uh, a few years ago when I was uh, traveling in Guatemala, southern Mexico and Belize. Spent a lot of time visiting the Mayan temples and looking into the Mayan civilization. And this is Tikal, which is the um, uh, one of the great temples that's visited of the Mayans and uh, best known of that incredible civilization. Uh, and it vanished suddenly a um, thousand years ago, and nobody really knows why. It was about it. It was the greatest of all the Mesoamerican civilizations, the pre-Columbian civilizations, probably uh, from 250 AD to about 900 AD about 10 million people, and they were very sophisticated. And uh, But suddenly, in 900 AD, they vanished. Something went wrong. And I wondered what. Now, the next picture is of Calac Mool, a little visited uh, Mayan temple in southern Mexico, right on the border with Guatemala. And this was the, the center of the kingdom of the snake, Khan. And was in the set, right in the epicenter, in the very center of the Peten rainforest, which is the second biggest rainforest in, the, in South America after the Amazon. And standing on the top of that temple at dawn, I had a kind of epiphany when I realized that uh, this huge, wonderful civilization had suddenly expired, and I wondered why. And I realized that with some research that all civilizations expire after about 500 years. And my belief is that they do so because they've used up their natural resources. Sounds familiar? In the past, they've always been able to move somewhere else. But we've used up most of the planet now. And we have to think about how to avoid expiring as a civilization through using up our natural resources. And what went wrong? Are we clever enough to avoid it in the future? So that got me researching into other civilizations that had expired, and ways in which one might avoid coming to the same fate, which we seem imminently close to doing. So using the four horsemen of the apocalypse as a kind of template, let's start with the first one, the white horse, which represents conquest, but it also represents pestilence. And the extraordinary thing is that my book was published on the 14th of February uh, in London, to uh, at a very good party. And not long afterwards, a month later, I became the first uh, named victim of the coronavirus. And I went into hospital. I was hauled off uh, after a week skiing, probably caught it in France. And uh, I was extremely ill for seven weeks. I was in hospital. I was in an induced coma for, for five of those weeks. And because against all the odds, I pulled through. I mean, at my age, I should have died. Nearly everybody does. But I survived and I became a bit of a, an icon. I was all over the media. You might have seen me on the cover of the time uh, and, and huge articles in the mail and everything else. Anyway, I became a sort of uh, success story. And the irony is that on page four of Taming the Four Horsemen, I forecast a pandemic. I even have pandemic on the cover of the book. And uh, uh, there's a wonderful irony in all that. But um, what the, uh, the pandemic that I forecast was obviously based on the Spanish flu 100 years ago. And this is what it would have looked like uh, then with perhaps 500 beds all lined up. This is a photograph from the time. And 
Um, our pandemic hasn't been nearly as bad as the Spanish flu yet. I hope it never becomes that way. But it made me wonder why, how you would avoid pandemics in the future. And um, it could happen much worse than, than what we're going through at the moment. I mean, we had wards like this prepared for the, the Nightingale hospitals haven't had to be used. This is probably 500 beds in, in, a, in America at the time of the, the Spanish flu. But I developed a theory, which is my first solution to the uh, imminent catastrophes facing us in this world, which is that we have devoted far too much resource to looking outwards into outer space. Vast um, billions have been spent, trillions indeed have been spent on uh, space research, which should have been spent on the greater infinity than there is in outer space, in inner space, in our own world. Uh, I find outer space sterile and uninteresting and I don't want to go there. I can understand that how exciting people find it, but do you really want to go and live on another planet in a spacesuit for the rest of your life? Instead of devoting those huge resources to understanding how this planet works. And if we um, uh, don't give up on this planet, but actually try and make this one work a little better, um, it becomes terribly exciting. You look inside uh, the trillions of microbes that we have in our bodies. And um, this one is actually uh, one that shows um, uh, an AIDS virus infecting a Im human immune cell. But the, the statistics, the numbers of, of microbes in our bodies actually defies belief. Um, there are more uh, life forms on your eyelashes. But each of you on your eyelashes have more life forms than there are people on the planet. And when we get into the really interesting area, which is your colon, your large intestine, I mean, the, the, the figures are, st are, are staggering. Uh, there are more, by a fact, uh, by a huge factor, there are more life forms in there than there are stars in the Milky Way. And that's 400 million. And there are 100 trillion cells in your intestines. And if we understood how these things worked, which we are just beginning to do, and it's really at the forefront of medical science now, it has huge implications. Your mood is affected by your bacteria um, and everything everything comes from these bacteria which uh, are there passing through your body and in your body. Now, this has huge implications for medical science. Uh, we could, uh, we, we, every breath we take, we breathe out 37 million bacteria. So like the Buddhists say, we actually do carry an aura around with us. And doctors and medical science is beginning to be able to uh, analyze those bacteria that we breathe out and understand where we came from, what we've done in our lives and what's wrong with us and what might happen with our diseases. So it's tremendously exciting, the potential for medical research in there. And we might not have had a pandemic if we had known these things, because it's perfectly clear that doctors don't really understand how these uh, viruses work. And, and that's where I would like research to be spent on. But it also has implications for lots of other things like farming. For instance, um, one could have vertical farming inside towns like this, where everything would depend on microbes again. Um, you have hydroponics, aquaponics, and it's right in the city center. There's no transport costs. And you can take the vegetables that are produced in there um, from these vertical farms straight to the restaurants and the houses around. And um, you even have fish living on the uh, output of the, um, the vegetables and fertilizing them at the same time. Then we get on to more exciting things, possibilities and ways of uh, saving the world, like insects. Now, everybody goes yuck at the idea of eating insects, but actually two thirds of the world do eat insects. I've traveled in many places where you can buy delicious insects on street stalls. And uh, as long as you get past the yuck factor, you can enjoy it. And uh, they are actually delicious. And they're also very simple to farm because the uh, mass farming of insects is actually very easy. Um, this is a Chinese mealworm farm. And uh, you can imagine the huge biomass that's produced from farming insects. And another factor of it, which is interesting, is that insects 
Um, there's no cruelty involved. Now, it is time we stopped eating meat. Everybody's saying that because the way in which meat is produced in the world today is absolutely obscene. The feedlots in, uh, that are seen in America with packing animals with hormones and uh, factory farms are disgraceful what goes on. But there's no cruelty with insects because they're just doing their thing. Um, and they're quite happy doing that in a tray in a factory as they would be in a, under a root of a tree. So... That takes one of the reasons for not eating meat um, away. And you can get very good protein produced in that way. So that's one step. But more exciting and where I think the solution to many of the world's problems would come and where we are, the direction we're heading in is synthetic meat. Now, synthetic meat is already being produced in uh, places, in factories, and it has huge potential. Um, the first synthetic hamburger was produced in 2013. And you cannot tell the difference between the meat that's of that sort that's processed in there as you could from the real thing. And what's more, you can make sure that it has the right constitution so that you don't get obese. Um, you cure one of the great problems of our modern age, which is obesity. And uh, it's full of nutrition. And the exciting technology that's getting now behind all this is meaning that you can produce anything and make it look like the real thing and taste better and do you good. And it has no um, downside, really. There's a Finnish firm called Solar Foods, uh, which is um, producing uh, food from electricity, water and air. And it's 20,000 times more efficient than land created for producing the same stuff. And the implications of this when it becomes cheaper than the real thing, which it will quite soon are incredible. And, and anybody who uses the yuck factor for synthetic food and says, oh, I don't want to eat stuff that's been created like, well, it's only like cheese or yeast. It's just using microbes to form this explosive amount of material, which can then be turned into anything, should go and visit a factory farm or a feedlot. And they'd very soon realize that producing it synthetically is a lot more sympathetic than having to go and, and see those um, cruelty being inflicted on animals. There will always be some meat that's produced from uh, grassland areas, but it should be a luxury product, not a daily product. Now, the implication of this that is most exciting is that the part of the world that I've been most interested in my life and been campaigning to save, which is the tropical rainforest. Now, what happens in, in the Amazon, for instance, which is now half the size it was when I first crossed it in 1958, um, half the size, half the greatest rainforest in the world has been cleared uh, in order by a, a, a people who believe that rainforest is bad. I mean, the awful president of Brazil, Bolsonaro, actually believes all rainforest should be removed and we should have mining and farming on the land and that all tri tribal people incidentally should also be removed um, from there and civilized in some ghastly way. Now, the driving force is to get rid of the rainforest. They then put in cattle, which is what real men in Brazil do, is, is cattle farm. The cattle are disastrous to the environment and uh, trample it all in, turn it into laterite. So, so having destroyed the rainforest, what do they do next? And this is the real obscenity. They clear, and I've been there and seen horizon to horizon of clear, bare land where there used to be rainforest. And um, they're uh, now growing soybeans. What's the soybean for? Feeding cattle in feedlots. I mean, it is, a, it is a real obscenity. Now, if instead of having to grow soybean to feed the cattle as, a, as an intermediary way of feeding ourselves, if, it was, if the, the food was produced synthetically uh, without needing to clear forests, then you could let the forests grow. And the same thing could happen in Southeast Asia where uh, the... the obscenity there is um, uh, palm oil. Now, if you could find a, a synthetic substitute for palm oil, which I believe if you devoted some of those massive resources that are spent on silly things like outer space, uh, we would crack that one. And then when I first went to Borneo back in the 50s, 50s, a long, long time ago, so I'm very old, uh, it was all solid rainforest from one end to the other. Now it looks like this. It's all being cleared for palm oil. Get rid of the uh, most of the palm oil, the big plantations, and replace it with synthetic things, 
that could be used instead, and it, the rainforest would regrow. So synthetic food could be the solution to saving the rainforest as well. And uh, you, uh, it, it would be very, very exciting. Now, the Maya, where this all started, must have done something similar to their land. They cleared it to excess. And uh, we don't want to make the same mistake with our planet. We are making the same mistake, but we can't afford to do it. So that takes care of the white horse, which is pandemics, leading to microbes, leading to revolutions in medicine and agriculture. So we move on to the red horse, which represents war. So wars mostly today are taking place in deserts. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, um, they are the result of poverty and overpopulation and, uh, and despair and people fight each other over water resources and over land. So my solution to that problem of creating warfare of people fighting uh, is to get the world having free electricity. I think this would take away a great deal of the reasons for conflict. And it's possible today. Uh, solar panels are cheap, very cheap, and getting cheaper all the time. Now, if, if you were able to produce free electricity for everybody all over the world, the implications are enormous. Last year, I was in Burma, up a river, came on a little house, this little hut, uh, which had a solar panel on the roof. And I asked the man, um, what's your solar panel for? And he said, the drive my iPhone, of course. I mean, he was in about as remote a place as you can get. But he was in touch with the outside world. He had leapfrogged modern technology. He didn't need to go through all the fossil fuel, diesel pumps, etc. He was in touch with the whole global system and could be studying for a degree at Harvard, for all I know. I mean, it is very exciting, the implications of getting people free electricity. And in Africa, for example, um, you get, if, if instead of giving our aid to corrupt leaders of the country, we gave our aid directly to the people on the ground and, for, for example, provided um, women in, in African interior with solar cookers, then instead of having to walk for the first part of the day for five hours to the nearest bit of remaining rainforest and cut it down, turn it into charcoal and bring that back and, and try and cook with it. Um, a solar cooker like this would mean that she could get on with the job and do something else, get onto her computer and, and learn a trade, write poetry, get a degree, do anything. Liberation would come from having solar cookers. And unfortunately, far too many people, for example, in Africa, then spend the second part of the day walking down to the nearest muddy river and bringing back uh, water on their heads. Um, instead of that, a solar pump like this would mean that she'd be liberated to spend the afternoon down doing something else and water would be free and clean. I mean, this could be done. This is perfectly possible. We have the technology now to have everybody in the world access to free electricity through solar power. It's radical. It's For me, that's the way we should be going. So let's move on to the black horse, famine. Here I really get my most radical of solutions, my most provocative one, which has annoyed a lot of people. When you see pictures of starving children, of course you want to help and you want to send aid. And ever since Bob Geldof and Ethiopia and the baby children there, we were all stimulated to dig deep in our pockets to help starving children. And the trouble is, it very often does more harm than good. What happens is that the farmers who did manage to grow a crop suddenly find that they can't sell that crop because uh, aid has, has come in and, and the markets are full of foreign food, uh, which has been dumped on them. And so they eat their seed corn and it gets worse. So we need a different solution to what's causing famine all over the world. And most famines are caused by drought. And... Uh, this is what happens when you have drought. And there are various ways you can try and deal with drought. Uh, in China, for example, I've seen desert reclamation being done on the uh, encroaching sands from the Gobi. And they put a square meters of uh, straw down 
and it's amazingly successful. They get undergrowth growing, it begins to get trees, and that begins to change the climate. But it's a very slow process, and we need something more radical. So my solution is that we need to make it rain. And uh, we've had the technology for this, you know, for uh, 70 years, and everybody's been terrified of it. Did you know that in 1945, well, in the late 40s, two B-29s took off in different directions? Um, one was the Enola Gay that dropped the first bomb on Hiroshima and started the whole nuclear this debate. Uh, but the other one was a B-29 that started did the first cloud seeding operation over New Mexico in 1947. And scientists have been scared stiff of this ever since. It's like a Pandora's box. Open the, once you start interfering with, uh, uh, um, with the weather, where on earth will that end? And they're right to be scared. It is a very dangerous operation. But it's, I think we've got to look at it and research into it. Uh, because it, there is an international treaty already, which virtually every country in the world has signed saying that um, you can't use uh, weather management for military purposes. And um, uh, so there is some possibility of control of mad people using it wrongly. But the technology has been there for a long time and we need to research and put into it. Now, I'm going to show you a little video of uh, because I can't resist it because it's so charming. Um, throughout history, chiefs, uh, kings and emperors have retained their power theoretically through being able to be responsible for the weather. I mean, even the Chinese emperors uh, were there because they were believed to control the weather. And the only modern rainmaker king has been King Bhumipal of, of Thailand, who had a passion for making it rain. And uh, this is a little video that he was made of his work. It's very embryonic work. It's Today it's much more sophisticated than that, but it's absolutely charming. So do watch King Bhumipal's little farting aeroplanes flying through the clouds, making it rain. It's enchanting. <laughs> charming i mean things have got much more sophisticated since then and uh as this slide shows there are um, other ways in which we can make it rain um the Ab arab emirates are spending a lot of money on these um, towers shooting ionized rays into the system and bringing rain down as a result um and uh it's also being trialed by a swiss company in mexico if we invested serious research into how to do this, 
um, and took care of all the imminent dangers of making it rain, we could change the world radically. I've spent a lot of my life traveling in deserts and uh, with the Tuareg and the Sahara particularly. And sometimes it doesn't rain for five years. Um, but then I've been there after a shower, brief shower of an inch of rain after five years and the desert blooms. It's extraordinary what happens. You get goods coming up, you get greenery, you get grass, all the camels get fat just on one little bit of rain. Now, if we could make it rain just an inch or two a couple of times a year, it would not only uh, change the, um, uh, the, the whole economy for those people, um, but it would begin to solve um, so many of the other problems. Uh, we, 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 we could apply the technology for avoiding floods, hurricanes, and all the other damages to the world. Things go dreadfully wrong. There have been awful failed experiments, with, which is why the whole rainmaking uh, philosophy has, um, has been set back years. But it's time for us to grasp the nettle and look at it. I mean, it's been used by the military lots. Lots of people don't know this. But the Ho Chi Minh Trail during the Vietnam War, the Americans made it rain every day over the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Viet Cong just still soldiers on and go through with wet feet. Um, and the China Olympics, the Chinese stopped it raining over the Olympics a few years ago. Uh, one of my favorite stories is um, from 2005, when President Bush made the first visit to Russia at the invitation of President Putin to attend the May Day Parade. And they were standing there in the Kremlin. It was pouring down with rain on the morning of the parade. It hadn't started yet. And President Bush turned to Putin and he said, Mr. Putin, uh, I didn't think it ever rained on your parade. And Putin said, watch this space. And an hour later, the skies cleared and there was a beautiful parade and everything marched past. And Bush said to Putin, how'd you do that, Mr. Putin? And Putin said, I did, we did what we always do. On May Day, we made it rain in the Ukraine. And that morning, they had sent 30 planes full of raw cement, sodium chloride, sodium oxide, all of whatever they dump out of the plane on the incoming rolling clouds coming over the Ukraine. And they had uh, um, made it rain. And it didn't rain in Moscow. They'd made the rain fall in earlier. Uh, and the, that, that's true. You can look it up on the web. It, it's, a, it's not an apocryphal story. It's a true one. So the silver iodine and dry ice and all sorts of things that they can use to do that. And uh, I believe that that's the future and could change how we make the world work. Because for me, the uh, one of my beliefs is that the only contraceptive that actually works is prosperity. Not everybody likes that philosophy, but it, it seems to me that the rich countries, Scandinavia, particularly Europe, America, have declining birth rates, and the poor countries who have droughts and starvation um, have increased birth rates because they have lots of children, so that uh, because they know lots will die, and they want some to look after them in their old age. Now, what does prosperity consist of? Prosperity consists of knowing when your harvest's coming in and being able to plant your harvest and uh, harvest it when it's not raining, and that's prosperity for me. A secure source of food. So we might even solve the great elephant in the room in this whole debate, which is the population problem, by some of my radical solutions. Just before we get to the, to the final horse, um, remember what happened in Australia last year. This is a picture of all the fires all over Australia. Now, apparently, the um, Australia has the wrong sort of clouds to seed, so they didn't do it there. But they did do it in Tasmania, and uh, that might have solved some of the dreadful rain uh, fires that we've had in California and Australia in the last year or two. Um, it's, an, it's an area we've got to look at. Finally, we have the pale horse, death. Now, I, I have uh, uh, used climate change as the big death that's facing us and the big problem we need to resolve, climate change and plastics. So here we go. We all know that climate change is real, at least everybody except President Trump and President Bolsonaro of Brazil. Everybody else knows. It's inevitable. It's happening. The evidence is all there. The ice caps are, are melting and uh, um, dreadful things are happening. The catastrophic effects of ice caps melting are already being 
clearly forecast by eminent scientists all over the world. And the potential sea, lies, sea level rises, even with some of the lower forecasts of a meter by the end of this century, are terrifying. That will displace 10% of the world's population. Most of the great cities of the world are at, at about sea level. And so dreadful things are happening and it's extraordinarily dangerous and we have to do something about it. Um, the, in Russia, in Siberia, there were last year terrible fires, unprecedented fires, released 120 million tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, this is looking over Yakutsk in the far east of, of, of Siberia. You can see the little fires starting and then sweeping across these ancient forests in Russia with, with appalling implications. So we have to look at my fourth radical solution, which also irritates a lot of people because it's radical and they don't want to go there. But again, I think it's where we have to go, not necessarily to do all these things with geoengineering, but to look at them and to devote much more research into understanding the implications that they would have. And there are so many forms of geoengineering that we could be looking at. Solar radiation management is one, which is stopping the uh, solar radiation that causes global warming coming in. And they're pretty terrifying things that are being suggested. Reflective aerosols, you would have all the airplanes uh, releasing sulfur out of their um, ends as they fly over the world, which would reduce, which would have the same effect as a volcanic eruption. Um, there is cloud seeding that we've talked about. There are putting great space mirrors in, uh, up in space to reflect the sun back. Um, and um, then there are also ways of, of removing um, CO2 from the atmosphere. Obviously, the best way is to reforest the world. And that's what I've suggested by um, replacing all the soybean plantations in uh, South America uh, with letting the rainforest grow back. That's the best way to do it, but it's slow. And uh, we need to look at doing more radical things. Then there are exciting innovations coming in from um, uh, carbon sequestration and capture, carbon capture and, and, and storing, storing it underground. You can either do it from the air. Uh, there are ways in which you can extract carbon dioxide from the air and, and store it, or much more sensibly, it seems to me, replace the fossil fuels, which have got to be on the way out with uh, filling all those spaces where all the fossil fuels came out of with carbon dioxide. And that technology is also on the way. These are all very exciting things which should be happening, including iron, ocean iron fertilization, in which you can uh, much of the uh, carbon sequestration in the world is caused by plankton. And, and apparently there are clever ways in which you can make the plankton much more efficient by adding iron. All rather dangerous, all rather risky. But I think we've passed the point at which we can uh, think that these things are too dangerous to try, or at least to investigate, and at least to invest serious money into trying to do it. Because if we leave it too late, and the tipping points are passed, and the um, uh, uh, sea levels start rising inexorably, then it's going to be too late, and we're going to have to devote huge sums of money trying to put it right, instead of trying to avoid it in the first place. So that's what my book's all about is trying to find these radical solutions. And then at the same time, there is the awfulness of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Do you know about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? Have you heard of it even? It's not well enough known. There's a, an island of plastic in the Pacific that is twice the size of Spain, twice the size of Spain. And it's only one of at least five such patches of, of plastic around the globe. And it's terrifying. I mean, this is polluting the world in a very, very insidious and dangerous way, because most of it is below the surface. There are places where you can see a big patch of, of plastic floating on the surface, but most of it is underneath the surface and is dissolving. And a lot of it is from discarded material fishing fleets, and it just floats in the, in, in the sea. But the plastic dissolves into nanoparticles, and that's where the real danger is. And it's incredibly pervasive, so that all life on Earth, including you and me, all 
are contaminated with plastic now. We all have plastic in our bodies, in our bloodstream. And it's, it's something that we should be addressing with huge urgency to get rid of the plastic. We can all do it in our homes by um, picking up plastic and, and, and disposing of it properly. Um, as they, somebody said recently, just imagine if all the 909 billion people in the world all picked up a couple of pieces of plastic every day, we'd get rid of an awful lot of it. But this stuff is coming down rivers, mostly in, a lot of it in the Far East. The Yangtze, 33,000 tons of plastic comes down every year and, and contributes to the worst river in the world. There are efforts being made to start a cleanup uh, in a small way uh, like this. People are trying to gather it up and, and dispose of it. I think something much more radical needs to be done. Again, banging my habitual drum about the waste of money in outer space. Think of what the money spent on a rocket being sent up to see whether there might be a microbe on Mars. And really, fairly pointlessly, if that money was spent on having large uh, aircraft carrier sized uh, ships, which gobbled up this plastic and turned it into bricks, into blocks for building which could be provided to people in developing countries who would then make their houses out of plastic. So it's disposed of in a practical way. And it's not that radical to think like that. I think it, it could be done and it should be done because uh, otherwise we're all going to expire in a puff of smoke. And the terrifying thing, I think why plastic really hits the button on this whole story is that you and I have so much of it in our bodies and you need to worry about that. This picture is a horrible picture. It isn't real. It isn't a real whale with stuff coming out of its mouth. It's a, it's a piece of artwork. But it tells the story more tellingly than the real thing in some, some ways, because that's what's happening. Our bodies, all animals' bodies, are being polluted in an extraordinary way, in a terrifying way. And we have to do something about it in order to avoid uh, the fate of the Mayans. So we bring it back to the Mayans at the end um, and learn from them. Their civilization, like every other civilization, collapsed because they didn't know what to do to avoid overexploiting their resources, cutting the rainforest down, changing the climate, having droughts, having wars, starving and disappearing. We don't want that to happen to us. If we we have the technology and the knowledge to do something about it. We don't have the political will. That's more of a problem. But we do know how to do it now. We're the most intelligent species the world has ever produced. We have brains that are of infinite capacity and initiative and innovation. We've got to do something about it. We've got to solve this problem. My little book is, the. I think it's the perfect uh, lockdown reading because you can worry about these things while realizing what the implications of it all are. Uh, so do uh, get it, read it, and uh, argue with it, as indeed lots of people do. But I hope it'll stimulate people to see what's wrong with the world and perhaps in our own, each in our own small way, do something about it. Thank you. Robin, that's a fantastic story. There are many, many questions which you can you can ask about what you do and, and, and amazing stories about your, your livelihood and your, your past and your travels. Uh, but uh, the book is certainly provocative. Uh, but how do you get people to listen? How do you get the people that count to listen to this or read it? <laughs> well, that's a um, very good question because it's happening. Have you noticed something called Extinction Rebellion? Have you heard of Greta Thunberg? The young are really angry at what we have done to our planet. And I think that's where the hope comes for the future. The young all over the world, including China, where some 30% of university students in the West are Chinese now. And that's got to rub off the, the interest in all these subjects. So all over the world, young people are pissed off with what we've done to their planet. And it's time. That's my hope. My great hope is that they will radically change things. Now, I don't believe in revolution. I've seen too many revolutions in my life. So revolution's not the answer. The people who suffer worst are the poorest people at the bottom of the food chain. 
Uh, capitalism has its flaws, certainly, but it's the only real game in time, and in town. And what capitalism needs is a jolly good kick up the backside, and that's what they are doing. And capitalism generates large vast sums of money, which we've suddenly had to devote to getting through COVID. Just imagine if we devoted the amount of money that we've mortgaged our futures with, um, because with, with rescuing us from COVID, if we devoted those a couple of few years ago into researching into how microbes work and the way in which viruses and, and uh, pandemics are caused, we mightn't have had to have this one. We might have known how to deal with it. So my hope for the future is that we will be able to do those things. And uh, obviously, you suffering from the virus, uh, having written about it and predicted it as well, uh, must have been an almost an epiphany when, when it happened. Um, how has that changed your attitude? Well, one significant way it's changed just in my own personal way was the thing that brought me out of my coma and actually saved my life was being wheeled into a, the healing garden, which Derryford Hospital in Plymouth has the first one in the country. And... Uh, there was an incredible moment when the sun hit my face and I saw the flowers and, and, and realized I was going to live. And so I'm raising lots of money trying to to make sure that every hospital in the, in the country has a healing garden. Because the healing power of nature, uh, which people are only now beginning to take seriously and not have a sort of wacky uh, kind of fringe activity. But there are so many good books coming out about it with now. And people are realizing that it is extraordinary, the power of healing in nature, both therapeutically for people who are very ill, like I was, and, and making life seem worthwhile, um, and then getting out into the country and doing what forest bathing, Japanese started. Uh, but also in such places like um, prisons, where having a garden has reduced the division rate uh, by a huge amount, so that the um, uh, it, it, it's, it's a very, very good investment to have a garden in a prison, in a hospital, in a school, everywhere. And, and it's not impossible to, to uh, restore the planet that way. Well, Robin, uh, thanks very much for joining us on the digital version of the Isle of Wight Literary Festival. We know you've been here before, and we very much look forward to seeing you uh, next year, hopefully, in October, when the, the, the real one will happen again. And uh, it's such good news that you've come through. Have you any sort of uh, suffering, any, any after effects? Well, that's uh, very interesting. People of my age either die or have very bad after effects. I'm a bit short of breath and I've got a couple of nerves that have been reactivated from being motionless for a long time in a coma. But I'm very lucky. And I'm uh, planning to climb Cornwall's highest mountain to raise, uh, as a fundraising thing in October. Um, so I'm all right. But what I'm hearing more and more, because I'm on quite a lot of boards as the sort of most prominent first survivor, um, is that a lot of young people are suffering terrible after effects. Um, they're getting uh, heart palpitations and liver failure and all sorts of dreadful things far worse than the old who either die or survive in reasonable shape like me. Um, so don't get it. Be careful. Uh, it's not worth it. It's worth the inconvenience of wearing a mask and doing all the other social distancing things is my advice to everybody. Very wise advice too. Thank you, Robin, for joining us. And uh, Taming the Poor Horseman is out now. Thank you very much. Our thanks to Robin Hanbury Tennyson. Thank you very much for participating in the Red Funnel Isle of Wight Digital Literary Festival. If you've enjoyed this presentation, please consider making a donation. Follow the Donate Now button from the homepage of our website. You can also benefit from great discounts by ordering via Blackwell's Bookshop from our homepage. We'd like to thank the loyal sponsors who've supported the Isle of Wight Literary Festival over the past years. Without their financial contribution, it would be difficult to attract the many wonderful speakers we've hosted, while keeping ticket prices down. This year, their support has enabled us to provide the digital festival free of charge. Special thanks to Red Funnel, who've been our title sponsor for many years, and, as well as providing financial support, offer a warm welcome to speakers and visitors to the island for the festival.